Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 352, the Oh My Goodness, It's Still Snowing Outside edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and on this take, I've remembered what day of the week it is. It's the 9th of December, 2017. <laughs> you know, I hope our audience understands that we have a casual program here. There's nothing professional about what we do. I have light <laughs> batteries go on and off all the time. Our audio will drop out. Um, we have clocks that go off at your place. I have children that scurry in from the street making all types of noise. And if the UPS driver comes, the dog will let us all know. And I, I really appreciate all that we have in, in our, our show here. Um, now, it's snowing here in Connecticut. I saw you post some pictures of the wintry mess going on over in England. What's up? Well, in my part of the country, though, it's, it's, only, it's only this small part. Um, we've had a huge amount of snow, about four or five inches. And inevitably, the whole of civilization has ground to a halt because it's never snowed in England before. And yes. we don't have the tires or the cars or, or the, the, the council say, oh, my goodness, this is what the grit for the for the roads was for. We better put some out there. But it's too late. So it's very exciting and very picturesque. But um, it takes everyone by surprise. Now, I saw you post a picture of your bicycle on snow-driven roads uh, <laughs> yesterday. So you are not without sin in all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're quite right. I went down to London for a week and I have a folding bicycle and it gets me around. Uh, and I was completely, I, I got a phone call saying it's, there's going to be snow up here. And I thought, well, there really isn't. Uh, and uh, when I got home, I discovered that actually uh, I, I had quite a difficult journey to make with because this folding bike has very small wheels. And I discovered for the first time in my life that very small wheels are not good with three inches of snow. Mm -hmm. So you're right, Kevin. I'm I'm uh, I'm a sinner and an <laughs> idiot, just like <laughs> all the others. You're part of the problem, not the solution, Mister <laughs> Gavin. Okay. Oh, this is not the first time people have said that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, anybody who's watched Anglican Unscripted from episode one understands that uh, we desire to be a critic of the broken church and to let people know what's going on uh, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, in America. And we do that by telling you just you know, what's going on, let you know uh, the news and what we think of the news. And with hopes that the broken church would repent and come back into the fold. Um, that's not happened yet. And as such, I'm a supporter when uh, people stand up and say, I've had enough, we need change within our church, and do that change. Now, I'm a big fan of the ACNA. They stood up and said, um, the Episcopal Church is apostate. We need to do something differently. Um, in the same way, uh, there's an organization called GAFCON that said, we're going to do something different in England. We're going to have the Anglican Mission in England. And we're going to do something differently. And uh, this week they had ordination services, which you were at. And I thought, it's a great time to talk to Gavin. Um, you're a big supporter of AMIE as well. But I, I kind of wanted to talk, and this is going to be difficult, a little bit about the optics I saw watching the live feed. Now, I'm obviously very prejudiced because I'm a camera person. And so my what I see may not have been what was happening at the service, um, but the person you had running the camera was not using a tripod. Am I right in that? It wasn't an earthquake, right? <clears throat> Kevin, I want to start by saying this was a very exciting, yes. very positive, very inspiring occasion. We had eight um, spiritually very attractive men standing up at the front, giving their lives to a fresh expression of the church. And in many ways, you know, this really is a marvelous and wonderful moment. Um, uh, I guess the, the 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 cake inside was was very attractive. The icing that they put round the cake for this particular moment was a bit was a bit patchy. So you're right. Um, who knows if it was an excessive trust in the Holy Spirit that led the people who were filming to think that it could as well be done with a pink iPhone being waved in the air free style as it could be by putting a an unnecessarily expensive piece of equipment on something more solid like a tripod. Maybe these are issues of style. And if, if they are, well, then this was a very um, exciting buccaneering kind of filming that went on. Um, 
and I'm just saying this as an observer and supporter, uh, I watched the live feed and um, this may be a technical issue. Maybe it wasn't recorded. Maybe uh, it happened off the live feed, but I didn't see a Eucharist. No, there was no Eucharist. Okay. I, 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 I mean, okay. To 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 take my tongue out of my cheek and to say that you know, I'm a you know wholehearted supporter mm -hmm. of this whole venture. It's wonderful, but I came away wondering why it had been made difficult in some respects for other parts of the church. Um, I, I've been criticized and before, Kevin, but for asking the question, how Anglican is the Anglican mission in England? Um, you know, we, it, there's no question it's in England. There's no mm. question it's a mission. Uh, but And there's no it, question it's filled with godly people. Oh, but totally. And yeah, it's a great it's, vision. And, mm. and when we look to America and, and the AMIA was, was how it started. So, mm. so this is all wonderful. But uh, I guess it would be helpful if there were if if, if conversations could take place of a grown-up kind ac across the church to ask how things could be made easier rather than more difficult. I think one of the things that that I've certainly tried to learn is that when I worship God in public, um, it's nice if it works for me, but particularly as someone with responsibility, I'm there to make it work for other people too. And I guess probably my reservation of what happened at the ordinations was there wasn't a great sense that AMIE wanted, were wanting it to make it work for other Anglicans. Um, so, you know, in the sense that there was no Eucharist, uh, I've had a number of people say, well, actually, that makes it invalid in terms of the tradition of the church. Well, AMIE are not really worried about the tradition of the church, so that's not going to upset them very much. No, but, on, <laughs> but, 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 on the, but on the other hand, um, well, I can tell us, may I tell a story? Sure, go uh, ahead. Well, once upon a time, there's a very famous man called Dick Lucas in, mm -hmm. in England. Dick Lucas was uh, behind St. Helena's Bishopsgate. He had amazing ministry, uh, uh, the very c c conservative low end of the church. And I was I was uh, highlighted as, as a kind of up and coming evangelical. This was a mistake, as you'll see in a moment from the story. And taken away on one of Dick Lucas's weekends. Kevin, I'm a provocative man without any sense of perspective. And I have made idiot mistakes the whole of my life. And one idiot mistake I made was listening to, to um, uh, listening to Dick Lucas explained to these this this great group of curates he got together that uh, from the New Testament when Jesus broke the bread he also taught the people so as as they shared the miracle of the, of, of the loaves and fishes he also taught them and that we were said well okay Dick Lucas said whenever there is a service of Holy Communion make sure that there's a service of the word too never never let a communion service go by without breaking the word to the people because that's what it says in the Gospels. So like an idiot, I piped up and said, excuse me, um, Mr. Lucas. <laughs> I see there was would it, going. Would it, would it also be the case from the model in the Gospels that you've given us that whenever there is a service of the word, we should stand up and say, let there be a Eucharist because that's what Jesus did. And I was never invited back, quite <laughs> rightly. I, I, but <laughs> if, if we can't, <laughs> if if I could be I could be rector of St Helen's Bishopsgate if only I'd kept my mouth shut at that probably point. yes I, I, I think not but one has to say by breaking the pattern uh, of the whole church and not having a Eucharist this then makes it much more difficult to access for 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 a whole load of people there's also the question of you know how do you do public worship well Anglicans mainly do it with robes it's true we've just passed. Well, the Church of England has just passed a law saying you don't have to have them anymore. Um, and they didn't have any robes, no robes, no vestments. It, it took informality to a level of undreamt of sophistication. <laughs> it was truly, truly informal. But but again, the difficulty is that this makes it, th th this places it at the extreme end of what it is to be Anglican. I found myself wondering, for example, if it had been a Catholic Anglican Mission Society and they had decided to do it with statues of Mary being processed around all the time and people bowing every five seconds, you know, how easy would it have been for, for other Anglicans to say, we, we can get on board with that? Yeah, so, or, or vice versa, uh, that would have been as divisive as well. I mean, uh, yeah. I think we've been spoiled by the ACNA. Uh, they have this big tent, and in this big tent, um, 
the services they have, at least in public, uh, tend to be well dressed. Um, uh, they're all consistent in how they are performed. Yet I can see some of the the um, difficulty in this because when I go to African events, uh, the bishops are often dressed uh, in the red colors that they so adore, um, even if it's out of uh, season or out of uh, uh, the color for that that season. And so I, I see some of the the difficulty within the, the whole of Anglicanism to have a consistency uh, to some of this. And I don't felt that so much, but um, it, watching the service online, it was kind of just one thing after another after another. Great sermon, great message, great ordinance. Um, uh, all things are going great, but you know, I'm not the only person watching. And when we posted the link on our uh, website and Facebook, the th same things I'm saying and noticed were noticed by everybody. Everybody said the same thing. Wait, where's the Eucharist? Everybody said, N "What? No robes? Are we not? Are, are we robed people not allowed?" Um, and so, I, I, I would hope that the AMIE would uh, know that they are a international movement as much as they are a national movement. And uh, I think that's that. That's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were with the, the service began quite rightly, mm -hmm. uh, and again, all credit to the organisers. Sure. With messages from four archbishops, and they yeah. were great messages. Uh, they were from Peter Jensen, from Archbishop Oko, and another African archbishop whose name I'm afraid I've forgotten. I hope he'll forgive me <laughs> for watching this, and and also from Foley Beach. Sure. But I wondered. The the only the only bishop who would have been comfortable with the style was Peter Jensen, mm -hmm. uh, and and for the other three, I, I, I know I know it would not have represented the Anglicanism they had in mind. Now, uh, as you say, uh, it's important we should not strain at gnats and swallow camels. Um, but uh, we all have a responsibility to make our Anglicanism accessible sure. to each other. And, mm. I, and I, I remember when Foley Beach came to England once um, for a meeting, um, and he said to the people, look, I come as an Anglican, I, I come with a, a with a deep respect and love of sacramental Anglicanism, uh, with a complete commitment to evangelical Anglicanism, to, to offering the word for repentance and conversion. And, and I'm very grateful for everything the Holy Spirit has given. Uh, if, if you have trouble with that model of Anglicanism, then, you know, our friendship isn't going to go very far. And the people he was speaking to actually sat back and they were a bit shocked because actually they came from only one segment of That's those right. three. Mm -hmm. we, we have to learn in England that, that this this breadth of Anglicanism is a resource the Holy Spirit's given us. It's not, it, he's not plunged us into a dysfunctional, horrible family where we have to put up with awkward relatives who have different cultures from us. This is... And that's where GAFCON gets it. That's mm. where the ACNA gets it. You know, totally. um, these are the structures by with which we, is the cornerstone and foundation of our belief. We don't, we don't argue over those. This is how we're going to grow our church, and we work together to do it. And um, you know, Gafcon, ACNA, uh, Africa, boom, they get it. Uh, so the, you know, and, and congratulations for that. It only took us two thousand years to sit down and say these things are important. <laughs> um, we need to move well, on. Uh, we yeah. well, finish up. Can we quick. just add yeah. one thing. The, the, the reason I don't think we're straining. Uh, at gnats and, and swallowing camels is because we need to look forward. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we have to do in this country is is draw together a breadth of Anglicanism that has, just like the a ACNA has, that has the richness to bring the resources the Holy Spirit has given to us and not waste them. And that means that, that uh, we can't afford to have an exclusive kind of Anglicanism that doesn't easily talk, communicate, love, understand, and above all, cooperate. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so that's really important. I think there was one last question that 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 hung like a like a shadow over the proceedings, and maybe maybe somebody can send me an email and sort it out for me. But um, AMIE are, are orthodox and complementarian in their understanding of gender, mm -hmm. but they've been placed under the uh, under the overarching authority of the Anglican Network in Canada, which celebrates enthusiastically the ordination of women to the priesthood. Um, this looks to me at first sight like a contradiction rather than a creative paradox. But since this issue 
is the most divisive one apart from gay marriage that we face. Uh, it's not clear what that signal is meant, how that signal is meant to be interpreted. Uh, as again, we try and, and, so, and I, in one sense, that's the thing that ACNA has not sorted out. Uh, you've kicked the can down the road very successfully. And maybe, maybe that's a lesson to us too. But it hangs there in the air as an unresolved issue. It, yeah, I mean, that's something that obviously will be worked out in the future. Um, now, in fairness to GAFCON, uh, you know, this is the second try as far as they had a great success with the ACNA. ACNA was waiting to happen. Um, nobody knew that the Church of well, some people did, maybe yourself, that, that the Church of England was going to crash so hard in the last five years. Um, no, I, I don't think anyone knew. Quite yeah, and so team. you know, Gafcon said, "Well, eventually we're going to put a team in in England and, and do something." Boom! That time came much faster than anybody had assumed, and yeah. uh, so you know, Gafcon uh, is doing their their best, and you know, obviously in a difficult situation, trying to. Uh, uh, put together a formulary for uh, the mother church. Ah, geez, I, I, I don't envy them. All right. Now, I, we, we we're talking about crazy Church of England here. I need to talk about the, the crazy Scots. All right. Oh, the wicked fairy. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> since you and I have been recording, we talked about a Scottish church that had Muslim prayers. Uh, we've talked about... Uh, a you know many other things that the, the Scots like to do that are so innovative, and now I'm looking at uh, an appointment of a a, a female bishop uh, in a conservative diocese, and then I'm looking at uh, um, a priest who wants to pray that the uh, the, the the new Prince George uh, suffers uh, homosexual attraction and becomes gay. And I'm like, what is going on? And I need to ask you, Gavin, what is with the Scots? <laughs> <laughs> well, it isn't the Scots. It's just that what you're seeing is progressive. Pro progressive. It's, it's not Christianity. So a progressive spirit mask masquerading as Christianity. So with the new woman bishop of Argyle, this was a, the most conservative diocese. Mm -hmm. And of all the places where, where they asked for a male bishop, uh, the liberal progressive conspired together to inflict and enforce a progressive woman bishop upon them. Um, if you remember all the screaming that took place when uh, there was an attempt to offer Philip North mm -hmm. in a diocesan, and then the, 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 you know, the, the progressive voices raised against him were cacophonous and bitter. You cannot do this to us against our will. A bishop is supposed to be a symbol of unity. Um, but the moment it's the other way around, uh, this is why it's never equal and never fair and never true, uh, they, they undermined the, uh, d the, the wishes and the needs and the representations of an orthodox diocese and forced on them a woman bishop. Mm. Um, uh, I note it, it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's simply reprehensible. Wow. Uh, uh, the, the, the other story you mentioned is, is um, I, I have to declare a special interest in this because <laughs> it was when the provost of uh, the uh, Episcopal Cathedral in, in Glasgow uh, had a reading from the Quran that I objected and uh, found myself uh, with a greater public profile than I had expected. So I criticized him once in the last 12 months already and I, I've criticized him again. Uh, he, he, in fact, wrote this article about Prince George a long time ago, but because of Prince Harry's engagement, he thought it was a great moment to release it. And he's an LGBT campaigner and he wants, uh, he wants, this was for the Church of England, he, the Church of Scotland, not the Church of Scotland, sorry, that's the Presbyterian Church. Uh, the Anglican Church in Scotland, the Episcopal Church, has just agreed to do gay marriages. It's mm -hmm. causing division and schism and congregations are walking out of their buildings and he wants the Church of England to do the same thing. So he had this prayer, you know, maybe if Prince George was gay, uh, this would teach the English to love gay marriages. I know, let's pray he becomes gay. Now, there, there are several problems with this. I, I've written a couple of articles, people won't see them, but the really bad ones are, should you really be using a child for this? Uh, and the next question is, if you start using prayer in this way, you need to be absolutely sure this is what God wants or it becomes magic. Uh, you know, uh, invoking spiritual um, forces to do something against the will of God 
uh, isn't prayer. It, it's it, it, what comes close to being what magic is. And the third, perhaps, really critical thing is there's been a huge fuss about not allowing people to pray with gay people who are suffering unwanted same-sex attraction. Uh, the, I can't tell you how much fuss has been. They've managed to get the, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the, 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 the British Medical Association, uh, all the professional associations you could imagine have been got at to say we, we will not allow any kind of reparative conversion therapy, and that includes prayer. So suddenly, in the, in the um, interests of equality, uh, the gay dean of, uh, of Glasgow Cathedral says, it's okay to pray the gay in, you're just not allowed to pray it out. And that gives you again the extent of the disingenuity, the unfairness, the lack of integrity uh, of, of this whole conflict. So all the way through this, the liberal spirit appears and pretends to play fair, but actually it's playing foul and it knows it is. Well, I'm getting phone calls from the dear wife who's probably stuck in traffic, so I need to take the phone call. Uh, I do thank you for your time. Um, quickly, St. Helens. Uh, they, uh, they, wrote, they wrote a quick letter saying, we are done with the deanery. Um, what are the implications with the Church of England in this? This is, Duke, this is the great church that Dick Lucas has established. Right. Um, they published a letter online during this last week saying, uh, because of the public... Um, stand taken by so many members of the deanery in favour of progressive Christianity, they are withdrawing from the deanery uh, in order not to appear to be walking together. Um, one can look at this in two ways. One can say, hooray, this is fantastic. Another Orthodox congregation making a stand against the Church of England. Brilliant. The downside is that the Large evangelical congregations like this never were very much involved in the deanery in the first place, uh, and probably this is not a sanction that's going to make the Church of England lie awake at night. Um, it's it's a it's a small step in the right direction on a matter of good principle, but it's only a very small step. All right, thank you very much for your time, Gavin. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and this has been episode three hundred and fifty-two of Anglican Unscripted.